Hi, and thanks for joining today's webinar. It's our follow up to our original DITA 2.0, a not backwards compatible release, which we held in October. I'm Chris Eberlein, Chair of the DITA Technical Committee and owner of Eberlein Consulting. Um, again, thanks so much for joining us today. And just a quick overview of our agenda. We'll do a little bit of basics with the welcome and housekeeping, introduce our panelists. We have a certain number of questions that we received by email after the first webinar or uh, more recently. And then we'll just sort of launch into taking questions from attendees. And we also do have resources that we know some of you might want to download and take a look at. So for our housekeeping, this webinar will be recorded and we'll post the recording on YouTube on the OASIS channel as soon as we can. Um, we'll also post a PDF of slides somewhere that they can be accessed. All attendees are muted, panelists are live, and We'll take questions throughout through the, the chat functionality and stop at different points to address them. So please queue up your questions. We're eager to answer them. So for today, in addition to myself, you've got Robert Anderson, who's a voting member who represents Oracle, Chris Nitsche, who is a voting member and a individual member, and Don Stevens, voting member who represents Comtech Services. And with no more ado, let's launch right into questions. So we've got a list here of the six or so questions we received through email. Uh, there were some others, and you know some of them were were particularly author focused, and we did just address those directly with email, and haven't listed them here. And we'll just launch right in. Um, we'll kind of move between different of a different ones of us are the panelists and answering these different questions. And after which, of course, we'd like to take the questions queued up through the chat. So the one question we did get from multiple places is what is going to happen to the specializations that are removed from DIVA 2.0? And here we're really talking about the learning and training specialization, the machinery task, and the um, pre task prerequisites domain that is used in the machinery task. So people really wanted to know where will these specializations be? Who's going to maintain them? Will they be compatible with DITA 2.0 or DITA 1.3? And our answer here is we have set up a OASIS open repository where these specializations can be stored. Now, an OASIS open repository is different from an OASIS technical committee repository. An open repository enables non-OASIS members to participate. And we certainly hope that folks in the community will participate long-term in maintaining and updating these specializations. But the DITA Technical Committee has committed to updating these specializations, these three specializations and making them DITA 2.0 compatible. So we've, here we've uh, got the URL available for this particular repository to hold the specializations. We've established a main and develop branch and seeded the main branch with grammar files from DITA 1.3 errata 02. And moving forward, we'll update the grammar files, not the documentation, to be DITA 2.0 compatible. Any questions here about this repository? Okay. Um, not hearing any questions, let's move on to the next one. And over to Robert here. Yeah, we get questions occasionally about coordination of DITA Open Toolkit releases 
and uh, new versions of the OASIS data standard. Uh, my typical answer there is that although I have participated for a long time in each community, uh, these are separate. They're not both run by OASIS. Uh, Ditto Open Toolkit is an open source project with its own contributors outside of OASIS. Uh, it does not coordinate with the OASIS timeline. Part of that is simply because the timeline follows standards track process and sort of finishes when it can finish after all the reviews are, are done. That doesn't necessarily line up to planned releases of the toolkit itself. So the answer about whether or not a new version of the toolkit will come out simultaneously, the answer is probably not. Uh, they could come out close together depending on when the standard itself is actually finalized. That said, as we've been rolling out toolkit versions for a while now, we've started to add little bits of beta support for 2.0. Uh, there are versions of the grammar files. Uh, they're not the absolute latest because they were just updated within the last couple of days, but the latest again will appear in the next version of the toolkit. Uh, as for the toolkit itself being backwards compatible, uh, we had a whole session on the data standard and its lack of backwards compatibility with the upcoming release. The toolkit as an open source developer run project is a little more free with breaking compatibility. Uh, it needs to, to be able to incorporate new features often, but any backwards compatibility that, that is broken between toolkit releases uh, only happens with major releases and is well documented in our documentation. So yeah, I think that answers the question. Uh, Chris, do you know if I left anything out there? Did we have any questions come through chat? Uh, not yet. Right. Let's move on to the next one. And over to Chris Nitsche here. Yeah, so one of the things we covered last time is the fact that um, in, the, in Dita 2.0, we have a canonical grammar, which is the RelaxNG grammar files. Uh, when in doubt, if there's discrepancies between the different flavors, the RelaxNG is the, the authoritative one. Uh, we are also going to be releasing the DTD, but we are no longer in Dita 2.0 going to be releasing the XSD grammars. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first and foremost, maintaining three flavors of identical grammars turns out to be a very labor-intensive task. Anytime you make a change to one, you have to make it to all three. You have to make sure that you've done it the right way in all three. And that's complicated specifically in the XSD case where certain features of Ditto like constraints and expansions and, uh, are actually fairly difficult to, to code up the right way in the XSD grammars. Um, that said, we do have a set of tooling. There's another OASIS open repository uh, that we can that we have the Ditto to RNG converter uh, that will, the Ditto RNG converter, I should say, that will take the authoritative RNG grammars and generate the DTDs and the XSDs from them. Um, and that's actively maintained, actively being developed by, by various members of the Ditto TC and the community. Um, and we actually use it or a flavor of it internally to generate the DTDs from the, the RNGs. Uh, we do occasionally in the Ditto 1.3 grammars have to go back and manually touch up and things like that. And like I say, it's, it's just, it's a very labor intensive process for a, a volunteer organization that's not actually all that big to, uh, to maintain the, the XSD grammars and all their complexity. Um, so, you know, but we do recognize that there is a need for certain vendors to be able to use the RNG. Um, so we do have that OASIS open repository for being able to generate those. And like I say, it is, it is actively being maintained. It's just not something that we uh, have the resources to manage and maintain uh, going forward. I can also add here that uh, two of the plans for the data RNG converter, you know, is that the tool will be enhanced so that it can provide monolithic, i.e. single file versions of DDDs and XSDs for tooling environments in which that would be more helpful than having um, the very, you know, the, the many, many, many file versions. Um, that one tends to use when you're creating a grid or data grammar file. Um, the other thing I will say is for data 2.0, we did not use this tooling to generate DDDs from the RNG. We developed both the RNG and DTDs and kept them in sync. Robert, anything you want to add here? Oh, I, 
I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, the important thing here is that, yeah, the, the tool should be updated to produce the monolithic XSD. And that means if you can uh, create your specializations configurations in RNG, which is dramatically easier than doing so in XSD, uh, you can still have all of the modular pieces and swap your domains in and out, specializations in and out, and then generate a single file XSD, which is a much simpler XSD. It's a single file, of course, and works just as well to enforce your grammar within a tool. Did we get any questions through chat about this? Not yet. All right. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next slide here. And these are changes to the specification. And people ask, are you making any changes to the spec? And we've done a couple of things here. Of course, we've really tried to do a pretty intensive review and editing of spec topics. If you look at the element reference topics, you'll see that they now have sections for uh, rendering expectations, processing expectations, um, usage information. We have made the normative statements much more visible in the text. And we've also aggregated them into an appendix at the back of the PDF for the HTML output. Um, Yorno Alverta really helped us out here with not with the normative samples, but in setting up our build environment so that our data code samples are automatically checked to verify that they're valid. And as a result of that, we did find a couple of code samples that were invalid and we fixed them. We've got some stretch goals. The first one is, is likely to happen and, and that's that we'll have an alphabetical listing of attributes. We've always wanted that. And less likely to happen stretch goals are an index and a glossary. Robert, anything you want to add here? Yeah, the, the alphabetical listing of attributes has always been kind of something that I wanted to have in there, just because there are often times when you want to try to pick as an implementer, you want to figure out where is this attribute valid. Uh, another note about that is that it, uh, as we've been working on it, it's not just an alphabetical list of attributes. It's a list of the attributes where they appear and more importantly, where there are exceptions something like the type attribute that has several different meanings depending on the element, we want to be able to clarify that so that, again, as an implementer, you can see that the attribute has the standard meaning, but you might have to anticipate that it's used differently on a few different elements. And I think that will come in handy. Do we have any questions? No, not yet. <laughs> I, I do see a couple coming in through the Q&A rather than through the chat. Oh. Uh, although not directly related to this issue. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I was monitoring chat, not QA. I've got QA up uh, as yeah. well. OK, so we have a question of where do I go to read the most recent um, HTML or PDF 2.0 draft spec? And the Answer to that is we've made, uh, we'll, we'll cover that later again in the resources, but we have beta versions of the grammar files, the spec source files, and a PDF version of the spec that are available on GitHub, and we'll have the link for you in the slide deck. And hopefully we can also put that link in the chat for folks who don't want to wait a day or two while we uh, get the slide deck out. So, Robert, over to you on this, I think. I think this one is. Oh, Dawn. This one's me. I, I do more than watch the chat and, and effectively watch the question and answers. Uh, so. <laughs> you do a lot more than that, Dawn. <laughs> uh, so, you know, obviously um, a non, you know, backwards compatible release will scare people in terms of, you know, do I want to adopt them? Well, maybe I can just stick with 1.3, you know, what's going to break and, and having, you know, 
good resources to help them migrate. And we obviously believe that the changes that we're making are going to be useful for everyone. And we want to encourage everyone to upgrade. So it's in our best interest to provide whatever resources that we can to help people upgrade. Um, but of course, we're also limited to, you know, the number of people that are on the, the committee and what we're able to do as well, but we're committed to doing what we can. Um, so from the DITA TC, we have um, the list of the deprecated items that we have removed. So that was one of the big things that we did is the, for several uh, releases, we have had deprecated items and we now with the, the non-backwards compatible are able to get rid of them, but rather than you having to scour back through um, everything and find where uh, which things have been marked as deprecated, we have a, a, a list so that's easy to for everyone to take a look at. And then we will be working on a committee note about how to do the migrations um, and of course any other resources that will be available would be in that committee note. Um, we're also, uh, I know I'm working on a committee note for um, troubleshooting that will um, update the previous thing on troubleshooting, which will incorporate you know, some of, of the, well, we'll incorporate all of the 2.0 changes to the troubleshooting topic. Um, so there will be uh, those types of resources from the TC themselves. Um, we also um, appreciate that Oxygen already has um, put in an, an add-on that will help people do some conversions from DITA 1.3 to 2.0. Um, obviously, we're still making some tweaks, and so their add-on is only as good as what we've what we've done um, in terms of the the spec and so on and the grammar files. But uh, they are working, you know, kind of side by side of creating that add-on, so you can prepare for, um, you know, what's this going to look like and what kinds of changes are going to need to happen, and do some of that that those changes uh, automatically with with Oxygen. And then, as Chris said at the end of this presentation, we do have a full resources slide that shows you what's already available. Here is there uh, may well be, and I certainly hope that there is other work that vendors have done. I may just not be knowledgeable about it. So if there is other work that vendors have have uh, have in the works, let us know so we can track that as well. Mm -hmm. And Robert for our final sure. question here. Yeah, tools that currently support DITA 2.0. Now, there are different things you might mean when asking about support. Uh, at the most at a most basic sense, we have new grammar files for DITA 2.0. And any, I guess, any vendor tool that lets you put in your own grammar files would, by definition, let you put in the new 2.0 grammar files so that you could do something like editing. The Toolkit and uh, Oxygen uh, both ship recent copies of the beta grammar files so that you can get that automatically without having to install them. Other tools may be doing that that I'm not aware of. That would be nice to find out about. As far as support for the new features, uh, that is, uh, I think, more limited. And I think a lot of vendors may be waiting to see the spec become more final. Uh, that said, some of the features are implemented in the toolkit. Uh, I think there is some progress on like the new data valve based flagging. Uh, a few of the other uh, items are going in there. Uh, I'm not sure what Oxygen might have done beyond adding in the grammar files. And I'm not sure what other vendors have added support for new features. I think the other key point here is the, the support for the data open toolkit and really any tool is very provisional and exploratory and in and, and beta since DITA 2.0 is not yet released. Although I think we really can say at this point, we the, the grammar files are locked down. If there are changes that the DITA TC is gonna make to those grammar files, you know, those changes will happen not because we're integrating any new features, but because people have been testing and found a bug or an error. Uh, there's that and uh, other cosmetic changes are, are likely to go in, uh, such as adding comments into the grammar files. But as far as the actual elements and attributes they define the organization, uh, those should be pretty much set and stable. Any questions or comments from the audience about this? 
don't see any. Okay, so here is really, you know, our, our we, we would like to hear from you all. What are your did a 2.0 questions. There was one other question in the Q&A that came in earlier from uh, Frank Ralph suggesting that he'd like to see a summary of the major changes as part of the DITA 2.0 spec. Uh, as he noted in the question, there's a placeholder for that in the current PDF. I think it's Appendix C4 migrating to DITA 2.0. Uh, so we will have information on major changes like that. Uh, it has not been fully fleshed out yet. have done even for the minor releases. Uh, if you look at the you know 1.0, 1.3 spec, you I think we had topics about changes from 1.0 to 1.1, from 1.1 to 1.2, 1.2 to 1.3. And although we're not going to continue with those topics moving forward, we will have a topic that kind of covers what are the big changes from 1.x to 2.0. All right, we have a, a question in here. Um, will DITA 2.0 support, um, or beginning to think about support incremental, well, okay, will DITA 2.0 support incremental builds, or are you at least beginning to think about supporting incremental builds, or is that just the DITA OT? Uh, as I understand the question, that is purely a DITA OT processing question. And uh, not something we can really answer on behalf of Oasis that's outside of the specification. Um, I also am getting a message that someone has their hand up, but we everybody is muted. So if you can just type your question in, that would be the best way, either in the Q&A or the chat. I think she is. Oh. There we go. been unmuted. <laughs> oh, okay. You've been unmuted. There you go. I've then been unmuted. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the nuclear industry and they're going to be making use a lot of the uh, relationship tables and not in the way that it's been demonstrated, but in the way that it goes from one document to the next in their regulatory documents. Is, is that going to be supported more because the example they give normally are just from, you know, very basic, but never from document to document. I think that is less a question of what we do in the data specification and more a question of specialized processing built by individual companies. We do have functionality within the data specification for uh, cross-document linking, but it is, we're simply saying there's, there's some basic data functionality for doing this or bit, you know, architectural features that might enable it. But again, to make it functional, it's part of what needs to be handled by processing. Robert, just, is there? Yeah. Anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I, I think at this point, no, but it sounded like there may have been some follow-up coming, so. Uh, I was just pointing out that in your, uh, when you give examples that is never mentioned, and I think this great functionality is being bypassed. I think that's largely because it does rely on a certain degree of support from processors. Um, what we try to show in our examples is functionality that we are confident any conforming processor will be able to support. Um, and cross document linking, there are a number of ways to solve that problem. There isn't a canonical in, in the standard, this is how you do it. There are a set of standards and conventions and, and mechanisms that could be leveraged to support that use case, which one you pick will largely rely on your use case and the capabilities of the vendor that you're using. And we hesitate to put examples in the specification itself that have dependencies on vendors. Now, speaking of examples, Corinna is asking if we have any 2.0 samples that could be used for testing purposes. 
so actual content in 2.0. We have the, you know, we've got sample topics that are, have been used in some of our um, proposals as we developed it at 2.0. I don't think we have a, you know, a sample set that we could package and, and provide as a zip. That might be something we could consider. Yeah, I think that is a good idea, particularly to help out with vendor testing. We have not developed an OASIS provided set of samples. We have uh, a set that, that I created that is really the most minimal set you can have. It's simply <laughs> a shell, uh, basically a, a topic element and a title so that it's valid. And we use that as part of our uh, continuous integration testing when we change the grammar files. So that if we were to add something to the DTD or RNG that created a parsing error, uh, we would be notified that of that and not able to merge it into our, our in-progress uh, branch. But I think that is the extent of the publicly available sample set that I've seen. Uh, the others have just been one-offs at this point. Mm -hmm. It would be relatively easy for us to probably construct, you know, a, a very small sample set that included the markup for various particularly backwards and compatible changes we've made between 1.x and 1.3. Um, for example, a task topic that allowed steps to nest, a topic that include, included hazard statements with uh, new markup, um, new usage of the link text element, the one difficulty I could see there is I'm not aware of a processor that currently has built-in support for all of these features. So it would only really demonstrate validity of the markup, not necessarily of the functionality, for example, resolving the link text appropriately. Yeah, and it's worth noting that the uh, public IDs on the DTDs and uh, the identifier on the RNG have both changed for 2.0. Uh, because they're backwards incompatible, we have to change the identifiers. So if you have a data 1.3 topic or map, you can tweak that identifier uh, so that it references 2.0. And if your vendor tool, uh, your editor has support for 2.0, even basic editing support, at that point, you can create any data 2.0 markup that you want. Uh, so it's not, it's not a uh, difficult task to create a 2.0 uh, topic or map for testing. You just have to tweak that identifier. Uh, and uh, El Elliot in the chat is suggesting a place where that can live. So I think we can, uh, I don't know, Chris, maybe talk about that on, uh, with the committee at, at our next meeting and see how we might um, get something populated. Uh, we have a question about, is there a reason that a publication could not include a mix of 1.3 and 2.0 content? Um, I, suspect, if, I suspect that's going to be a question for your vendors. Uh, it depends on whether the vendor has implemented 2.0 in a way that prohibits mixing, which is possible uh, depending on, on what features you're using and how they're used. I would anticipate that at a basic level, I think most common is probably going to be 1.3 topics with 2.0 topics because you may not want to go through and migrate everything from the past at the same time that you're starting to use 2.0. I would hope that most tools can safely accommodate that. Certainly when parsing for validity because they reference different grammar files, you've got your version specific identifiers, it should be perfectly fine to parse them it's whether in implementing 2.0, uh, your vendor tool has done some processing that sort of disables mixing with the 1.3 version. I'd also say that one of the exercises we go through as we develop the 2.0 version of the spec, I should probably put that in the past tense at this point, uh, is uh, keep track of when we do make breaking changes and document how a user might migrate their content to adapt to the change. Uh, sometimes that's easier than others, but we will be, I think, publishing something 
in conjunction with the spec that describes a migration process. Mm -hmm. uh, Birgit has a just a late question, so I'll just summarize. Um, she asked about the consequences for LNT. Um, so to just quickly summarize for you, Birgit, the um, the the specializations that will no longer be part of 2.0, which includes learning and training. Um, will be put into an open repository where everybody can can get to that, including um, and contribute to that, including non OASIS members. Um, and the uh, TC itself has committed to bringing the learning and training and, and all of the specializations up to uh, to a 2.0 uh, support. So any changes that were made in 2.0 will be supported by learning and training. It of course doesn't have any changes itself, but it will it will support all of those um, changes and then be available for you in the repository, the open repository. And the one thing I would add there is we are not loading the document, we have not loaded the documentation source into the repository. The repository simply contains the grammar files. So the data TC will not be updating the spec topics and documentation for learning and training. And, and one reason for that is, of course, lack of resources. We're trying to focus on the uh, new versions of the standard. But the other reason is that the spec topics tend to define things like what the element means, and that's not changing. We're not doing something that will change the meaning of any of the learning and training elements. The only reason to provide the new 2.0 versions in a separate repository is so that you have something that is fully compatible with all of the elements in DITA 2.0. So the, the, the meaning of how those specializations are used is not changing. changing. Uh, we have a follow-up on the mixing of the 1.3 and 2.0, basically, of con 2.0 content into 1.3 content would be a train wreck, <laughs> is the presumption there. I think, again, that's going to depend on your processor. And there are certainly ways you could do it that wouldn't have any problem at all. Um, there are ways you could do it where you'll be bringing in all sorts of 2.0 specific markup into a 1.3 topic, and there it's your results are going to vary uh, depending on what your tool is prepared to accept. That one in particular is a little complicated just because we have one of the things we changed is the way you validate the legality of CONREF. Um, the, the, the mechanics of that are very different in the new version and uh, making them play nice could be a bit of a trick. Yeah, although one of those changes is to simplify it for implementers where 1.3 had a lot of rules about checking domains and validity when con refing, uh, most of which were rules that hit the, you know, the 0.1% the case. Uh, they were nearly always uh, ignorable just because they weren't doing anything. Uh, it was really trying to make sure you were valid in extremely rare cases. Uh, most of those we've done away with just because they had so little practical impact. As a result of that, a DIBA 2.0 tool might more safely conref from 1.3. Uh, if you have a tool working with 1.3, it may still have some of those checks in place. and It, it probably would throw a lot of uh, mess around if you tried to pull in 2.0 content. A little background here. For those of you familiar with uh, the 1.3 concepts of, of weak and strong constraints, those have gone away and did a 2.0. That's part of the simplification that Robert alluded to. Any other questions? Yes, I can follow up on John's uh, question about that Conref there. Just knowing what I know about Did Open Toolkit and similar processors, I, I think a lot of tools to try and accommodate both 1.3 and 2.0, a lot of processing tools, we'll probably try to normalize the markup to a common set and then continue processing. In a tool like DidOpenToolkit, 
that means you probably won't hit too many errors trying to con wrap between the versions just because it's all going to be normalized to something that, for the most part, follows the same processing path. That said, you could end up with stuff in your HTML, PDF, output, whatever, that isn't necessarily what you expect if you're trying to pull in something that, that wasn't supported. That's speaking purely about basically background processors. I think vendor tools that are editors trying to display content, render content live, where it is explicitly working with a 2.0 topic or a 1.3 topic and all of the rules around that for displaying on, on the glass in front of you, it's probably going to have a much harder time trying to make the two interact with something like Conra. I think this is where, you know, the community may well establish a certain number of best practices. Consultants may be making recommendations to clients. Um, certainly, I think if people are, you know, have existing 1.3 content that is legacy, there's not going to be much purpose in bringing it forward. And, you know, then it's really the, these cases we're talking about here is where you probably have some shared resources. And that might be a case of where you want to uh, branch those shared resources and, and you know, have a 1.3 version and a 2.0 version. And again, th this is really going to depend, I think, on, on, you know, what is your authoring storage and publishing environment? Yeah, and you Robert, may want to speak to your vendors and see what they're prepared to uh, work with. And if your uh, vendors, your editor, your content management system all say that these work happily together, then you're probably just fine. I am not seeing any more questions. And to remember, we, you know, do have the ability, you know, you, to, you do have the ability to raise your hand and our moderators from Oasis will unmute you. Um, we would love to hear what any of the particular vendors on the call are currently doing as far as preparing their tools to accommodate to the 2.0. or if there's something that the vendors need from the TC in order to make that, that work uh, happen. Ah, Lee, Lee has been given permission to talk. Yes, I'm honored. Um, so from the vendor standpoint, uh, I've done a bit of playing around with this and um, it's because because our integration of data is really very straightforward. It's been pretty easy for me to to make a lot of progress on that. It's a side project. Um, nobody's really lit a fire under me to do that yet. But um, there's just one outstanding issue. I, I'm going to have to re-specialize one item in our uh, DRM related stuff. But other than that one thing, it was really a very straightforward implementation. Um, so, and, and to someone's earlier question, because of the way that we, you know, we integrate, it is possible to have one set of grammar files for 1.3 and a completely separate set for 2.0 and have two sets of content living side by side that are referencing those different grammar files. Um, I wouldn't do it myself if I didn't have to, but um, it is going to be you know, possible to do. So um, I, I don't have any date for kind of making a preliminary configuration available to any of our customers. You know, I'll, I'll get to it at, at some point when all the other fires have been put out. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Sure. And I've just, I've opened up the overview of DITA 2.0 
uh, slide that we used for our very first webinar. If people have any questions about particular part components of the DITA 2.0 release, various architectural changes or improvements, new elements, new domains, behind the scenes changes, things we've removed. Um, I do know that one of the questions that we got prior to the webinar and didn't include here in the slide deck is folks asking about, gosh, you know, you've removed the, and I may get these, these element names wrong, the, X, the XTRC and the XTRF attributes. We use those, what do we do? And, um, you know, they, I think the answer to that one is very simple. It's, you know, an easy specialized attribute specialization to make that you can then reincorporate into your DITA 2.0 company specific grammar files and keep those attributes. Chris, do you want to talk about what people can do to help out? Can help out in terms of just um, you know join, joining the effort, becoming you know involved more in all of this. Well, I'm happy to make my standard plea, which is please remember that the DITA Technical Committee is a volunteer-run effort. Increasingly fewer voting of our voting members are actually sponsored by companies. Uh, more and more of us are individual consultants or volunteers. And it we've alluded a number of times as we talked to Dita 2.0 about limitations and resources. So if your company is an OASIS member and you are have not joined the Dita Technical Committee please do so. If you are a data technical committee member, but not active, consider whether this is a place where you could invest some time and energy. Um, we are very much limited in terms of how much we could do by the constraint, you know, our resource constraints. And open the floor to other TC members to expand on what I've just said. Robert, Chris, Don. Yeah, particularly it would be it would be nice to have uh, more vendor participation. I think you've noticed several times during this uh, discussion itself, where we are generally unaware of what a lot of vendors are doing already to uh, support 2.0. We'd love to hear from all of you uh, as to your progress, any difficulties you've had implementing, and your your thoughts on 2.0. And participating in the TC itself would be uh, another way to to make that known and yeah, uh, have everybody find out about the work that's going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to jump here into the resources section because obviously one of the very first things we really want to ask everybody to do is take our DITA 2.0 grammar files out for a test drive if you've not yet done so. And so here we've got the links for uh, where you can go to get packages of the source. And that's both the grammar files, the documentation source and PDFs for the draft spec. Please note that we have two different GitHub repositories here, one for the base, which base holds topic, map, um, subject scheme, data val, and then the technical content specification, which contains concept, task, reference, book map, troubleshooting, et cetera. Um, so you do need to go to two different places here to get the source. And of course, there are two separate draft specs. And again, a reminder for folks that what we anticipate is that uh, the DITA 2.0 base will probably be released slightly before the technical content package. We know that it would be ideal if they went hand in hand 
but it's possible that, uh, or probable that we can't make that happen. Uh, there is a question. Are we sharing these slides somewhere? How, how can they get these slides? Um, I will make a PDF of these slides um, after this call, and I'm going to upload it to a publicly accessible part of the TC repository and ask D and Jane at Oasis to send out that link to folks. Um, Previously, I'd put slides up on SlideShare, but I just discovered today that uh, SlideShare has been bought by a company called Scribed and that um, PDFs previously located there, such as the PDF of our first webinar, can no longer be downloaded unless you have a paid Scribed membership. So PDF of these slides will be you know, I'll write it to an OASIS repository and you'll get an email shortly after this webinar. Are there more uh, comments coming through chat? Um, no. Okay. Oh, wait, here. I have a new one. Let's see what else to say. I like this compare control oh, for the 1.3 versus 2.0. Any chance we can get this as a topic cluster in the 2.0 spec? I'm looking at the spec draft here and can't find anything like this. Oh, so the slide that you were showing before, Chris, that just kind of summarized here's everything. So um, potentially that's related back to. Are we the, talking about this slide here? Yeah, I think so. That's what it's saying. Um, and so having some kind of each of these being a topic in the 2.0 spec itself, that might relate back to that earlier suggestion of the, the summary of the major changes being in the migrating to 2.0 uh, C4 section of the spec. I doubt that we would put, have a topic cluster in the spec. However, it is possible that we put together an auxiliary document such as a committee note that might be a high level overview of data 2.0. Um, the reason I'd say it's unlikely we put it in the spec is I think what you're asking for here as a topic cluster is more high level user focused description of these changes, you know, such as we have here in the slide deck. And that probably is just gonna fit better in a committee note than it would in the specification. So I'm going to jump back to the resources and make, to make sure that we get through all of our resource slides. Um, we have, as mentioned earlier, number of different migrating to DIDA 2.0 um, references. And if you want to know about deprecated features removed from DIDA 2.0, there is a, a document here in the, in the OASIS repository that you can read. And it really is, this is the stage two, a PDF of the stage two proposal we had for removing these items, which is a list of what was deprecated, uh, what's going to be removed, and what are our suggestions for how people would then, um, you know, handle mi a migration path. We also have a list of small bug fixes and changes for DITA 2.0 that were not included in this uh, list of deprecated features. This is our kind of like ongoing bug fix list as we um, finalized DITA 2.0. These fixes have been made in the grammar files, but they're not yet thoroughly documented. And then as alluded to, of course, we um, have that migrating to 2.0 committee note that's forthcoming. Do we have any any other question? Any more questions that have come in? Uh, Nancy suggests that the previous webinar slides get put wherever we're putting these as well together. So I have got that on my list. All right. Yeah, I had I 
want to thank Frank from Parsons for letting me know that those slides were now behind a pay firewall. I would not have known that. Well, I think if we don't have any more questions come in, um, I'll just turn to my fellow panelists and say if there's anything else that you, you would like to share before we uh, close the webinar. Any thoughts or comments about the process of developing DITA 2.0 that people might find helpful to know about? Well, I, I mean, I think it's important for people to know that you you can have an influence here. You know, one of the things that happened with with one of the things I was championing on the, the troubleshooting um, updates and everything is that we did get feedback. People looked at the at the proposals. They looked at you know what we had approved and and wrote. You know, this is not quite what what we would hope for. And you know, we we paid attention to that. It might be past a little bit of some of those changes being possible, but in terms of like writing uh, that that got fed into the community note for the troubleshooting of you know some of those examples. So you know to help other people, you know if you see how you're going to be able to apply this and everything, you know you can have a, an influence on on both the future, but also how we help other people right now. Um, you know, so we really do appreciate you looking at everything and and giving feedback. And that's an excellent point. And one of the things I'll be sure to add to the slide deck before I make a PDF is the email address or the ways in which uh, folks can contact the DITA TC and provide feedback about DITA 2.0. Um, we have a functionality called the DITA comment list. And you do have to join the DITA comment list just because of um, OASIS I IPR modes and policies. But that's a simple join. And then it is anytime you send, you post a DITA comment, um, those emails promptly get put on the agenda for the next DITA technical committee meeting. And we consider those very seriously and respond to them quickly. Robert or Chris, anything you'd like to add before we close? Uh, just that it's, it's been a lot of work. And uh, as you review this, I, I think if you're wondering, you know, why did they change this? The, the watchword really in DITA 2.0 is, is simplicity. I think in almost every case, or especially the backwards incompatible changes, it's not that we removed functionality that, that, that we didn't like, it was that we removed something and then we would replace it with something that is easier to implement or easier to author or easier to comprehend uh, and might be more extensible than the way we used to do it. Um, so, so as you review the changes and as you identify things that have changed, uh, keep in mind that that's probably why uh, that, that what we pulled out has been replaced with something that's gonna be easier to deal with from a, either an implementer standpoint or from an author standpoint. And just to sort of echo that and the encouragement to participate, a lot of those simplifications came from hearing feedback that why are, why is it done like this? And when you get you know five or six people asking, why is it done like this? You start to realize maybe this is something we could do simpler. And a lot of those simplifications came about for that reason. Uh, things that people on the TC themselves had noticed or that the uh, people that we support, but also from the community. And so, you know, speak up and when we hear these things, we, we take them seriously. And that's where a lot of these changes have come from. I think one of the best, perhaps the best example of that, Robert, mm -hmm. is the proposal you championed, which was enabling steps to nest and removing substeps. Yes, and that's one where uh, people had asked me why you had to have substeps and not just nest steps and for many years, I just gave the stock answer that I had learned the first time I encountered that. And like, this is why it's there. And there were reasons. And when I asked uh, my user community that I was supporting, 
what they would like to see done differently in 2.0 if they could break something. Uh, that was the number one request was let steps nest, which is really quite a small change. It is backwards incompatible, but I think I got like five different reasons given uh, within the first day from five different people saying, this is why I want it. And I heard those, like, yeah, those are, those are all good reasons. And that's something that we should seriously consider changing. And it's, I think, one of the more popular proposals that I've worked on for 2.0. Even though it's, in the end, quite a small change, it's one that I think will affect every author of task topics in a, in a positive way. We do get one last question just came in about uh, whether 2.0 has any special concepts for accessibility. Um, I'm not sure, um, Birgit, if, if you have specific things about accessibility in your question. Are we talking about that this is one area in which we have really never need, had to make changes to did a for accessibility because DITA was designed from the beginning with accessibility really at the forefront. We made a very minor tweak in DITA 1.3 to accommodate some very kind of extreme edge cases for accessibilities and tables. But accessibility has uh, really been there from the very beginning. Um, it is something that we try to consider with each proposal. Uh, if it has a negative, like if it's going to break accessibility, it's something that can't go in. It's, that, that's a, a core requirement of the data grammar is that it has to be able to support accessible content. And I hate to say again that talk to your vendor, but talk to your vendor because data is an authoring framework. So, so we need the ability to. Uh, to the extent that accessibility features are an authoring function, we're, we're incorporating those. But in many cases, uh, accessibility is a function of how the content is delivered, which will not be in the native data. And so it's up to your vendor and your publishing stack to make sure that the output that comes out of your data input remains accessible. So again, if we have end users on the call, um, if your authoring tool, your editing tool is one that inserts alt attributes on images, <laughs> please, please talk to your vendor because those will be not supported and get a 2.0 at all. And I know our, our primary audience today is implementers and vendors, not end users, but um, that's going to be a critical change for at least one integrated CCMS and authoring environment that is on the market. Okay, I want to thank everybody very much for calling in today and for all of the great questions we got. And our also our, our my other panelists and uh, Jane Harnett and DeShure at Oasis for the administrative work and collaboration in setting up this event, this webinar. We really appreciate it.